Hello, my name is Polly Terzian with the NYU Bradamus Center, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's webinar, a conversation on Uncounted, the Crisis of Voter Suppression in America. We are joined by Gilda R. Daniels, an NYU Law alumna, professor of law at the University of Baltimore School of Law, and the author of this discussion's focus, Uncounted, the Crisis of Voter Suppression in America, in conversation with Wendy Weiser, Vice President of the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. Thank you to the NYU John Bradamus Center and the Brennan Center for making this program possible. This webinar will be recorded and audience members are encouraged to use the Q&A box to submit questions throughout the conversation. Closed captions are also an available feature during this session and can be enabled at the bottom right of your screen. Now, I'd like to hand it over to Wendy to begin this evening's program. Thank you so much, Polly. Um, I'm Wendy Weiser again, Vice President for Democracy at the Brennan Center for Justice. And I'm delighted for, to, for you to join us today to talk about this terrific book, Uncounted, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America. Voting rights are at the center of our democracy and yet they are under serious attack today, fueled by lies about voter fraud and the legitimacy of the 2020 election, we are facing an unprecedented wave of new laws rolling back access to voting, widespread gerrymandering targeting communities of color, and novel threats like election sabotage legislation that would enable partisans to meddle in election administration and even attacks on our election officials who run our elections. These developments are not race neutral in their origins or their effects, and they are not wholly new in America, as we're going to hear. Joining me tonight is Gilda Daniels, the author of Uncounted, Voter Suppression in the United States, and there couldn't be a more qualified person to write this book. As you heard, Gilda is an associate professor at law at the University of Baltimore School of Law, where she focuses um, her scholarship on the um, intersection of race and democracy. Simultaneously, she is the Director of Litigation at the Advancement Project, a multiracial civil rights organization that focuses on community-based lawyering. And she served as the Deputy Chief of the Voting Section in the United States Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division under both the Clinton and Bush administrations. Over two decades, she's investigated, negotiated, and litigated cases involving voting rights and all the laws that protect them. She's a nationally recognized voting rights and elections expert, consultant, and public speaker. And as she beautifully writes in her new book, she grew up in rural Louisiana, where she and her family saw firsthand the continued efforts to suppress the votes of Black Americans and other minorities. And she recounts how vote suppression morphed during her grandmother's lifetime, for example, from a period where she was not even allowed to vote through changes brought about by the Voting Rights Act to a new voter ID laws that stopped her from voting in her 80s, as she didn't have a birth certificate in the state she moved to. These specific tactics of voter suppression may have changed, but a lot has remained the same, and I welcome Gilda to talk about that. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Wendy. So um, I wanna jump right in. Um, there's so much here, um, both today and in your book. Um, in, you, in your book, you describe what you talk about, the cycle of voter access and denial, a history mm -hmm. of expanding voter rights and freedoms followed by backlash. And you, you dub this free at last, not so fast. <laughs> and I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about this cycle and the role that backlash has played in the history of voting rights and equality in America and where we are today in that cycle. Great, again, thank you so much, Wendy. I'm so happy to be with you today, as well as with NYU, my alma mater, uh, and the Brenda Center, uh, and the Brenda Center, of course. Uh, so I do talk about what I call the cycles of voter suppression. Uh, and I, and I, 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 I wrote the book so we could connect the dots, right? And using connecting the dots of history and race uh, and, and, and the law and democracy. So. Uh, because it is important that we understand that none of this is new uh, and that we can, we can certainly look to the past uh, so that we can hopefully uh, avoid uh, the things that we've seen in the past. Um, so the, these cycles of, of voter suppression 
uh, actually occur after we have periods of great progress, right? So we'll have a period of, of great progress, and then we'll see these um, suppressive laws that take place that, 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 that where we see a, a, a market uh, regression. I look at certainly the um, uh, reconstruction period, but it actually starts at the beginning, right? At the beginning of our country and the founding of our country where we said at we have this paradoxical democracy where we said that you know all men are created equal, and at the same time we had the three fifths compromise, that essentially for for purposes of apportionment, um, it, we said that um, persons would be counted certain enslaved persons would be counted as three fifths of a person as, as opposed to a whole person. So from the beginning of the founding of our country, we decided for purposes of voting, right, for purposes of representation, that we would treat uh, the 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 uh, certainly the 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 that we would treat persons uh, certainly uh, uh, per, uh, people of color in particular as less than certainly uh, white voters and we know that from the founding uh, white men with property were allowed to vote while others were not and you can go from the founding to uh, the passage of the 13th 14th and 15th amendments which was about 100 years and at that point you see with the 15th Amendment in particular, where Black men are given the right uh, to vote, uh, that they embrace it and elect all, uh, approximately 2,000 persons to local, state, and federal elections. And these are people that are, that we're not talking about persons who are a generation out of slavery. We're talking about months, years, right? A few years out of, out of slavery. And in places like Mississippi, there were two African-Americans sent from the state of Mississippi to the United States Senate. We hadn't had two African-Americans from the South in the United States Senate until 2022. So if you think mm -hmm. about the, certainly the power of the vote, having uh, uh, persons uh, to register and vote and the power certainly that the power of the vote has, and that in certain during reconstruction, it was the first time in the history of the world where we saw a multiracial democracy. And then, and, then, and then if you think about it, we, we only, we're only talking about white men having the ability to vote and black men. Uh, and so you had you know, those, those elections and you saw uh, uh, certainly uh, formerly enslaved uh, black men embrace it and, and elect persons to office, uh, to various offices. But with that, certainly shortly thereafter, you get the, the, this period of redemption where certainly Whites in the South, in particular, felt as if uh, they that that we needed to need to roll back to certain times pre uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. So you saw the passage of state laws, um, such as poll taxes, literacy tests, uh, the grandfather clause, and other measures that were meant that had the intent of uh, removing those recently uh, enfranchised uh, black men from the voter rolls, and it was very effective. In places like Alabama or in Louisiana, where there were approximately 100,000 black men registered in early 1900, around 1901, 1906, around 1906, where after the passage of the grandfather clause, uh, literacy tests, uh, poll taxes, and other measures, that number went from 100,000 registered black men to 1,000 because of those suppressive state laws that were passed for the sole purpose and certainly with the, with the real intent of removing those persons from the voter rolls. You saw the same thing in Alabama where there are approximately 140,000 black men who were registered to vote. That number went from 140,000 to 46 to less than 100 because of the passage of suppressive state laws. And unfortunately, I think we're seeing the same thing today. You had a period of progress in, in 2020 after the 2020 election and be, uh, because of that, and you had approximately 60, what, 65%, 64% of persons actually uh, participated in the election process. I, was, I would consider that a great progress. Uh, and, but once, uh, you know, and, and, and you had the election of a second African-American from the South uh, to the United States Senate, once something that hadn't happened since the late 1800s. Um, and with, the, but because of that, now you see uh, laws, state suppressive laws, uh, that are trying to roll back uh, those numbers and the and the, certainly the level of participation that we've uh, seen recently. Now, 
as you're sort of tying the past and the present, I, I found that one of the most compelling features of your book was how you tell the story of vote, voting rights and vote suppression in America also through the lived experiences of your own family members, mm -hmm. your great grandparents, your grandparents, even your parents. And I think, you know, in addition to just making that really personal, it stands as a strong rebuttal to any assumptions that these exclusionary and violent experiences of the past are long gone and don't impact today. And I was especially, I, as you, you just referenced um, Louisiana, um, mm -hmm. what happened, um, I was uh, found especially compelling the, the stories of your grandparents and your family history in Louisiana and how that reflected on the history of voting rights in America. And I was hoping you can tell us a little bit more about that and what the, your family story does in Louisiana tells about equal representation in voting rights in America past and present. Absolutely. So I use as a frame for the book, my grandmother. My grandmother was born in 1919, yet she didn't vote for the first time until the 1960s. If you, it's just most, certainly as most people know, we just celebrated 100 years of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which provided the right to vote to women, right? So my grandma's a woman. She was born in 1919, a year before, certainly the, the, the 19th Amendment was uh, passed and now, and, but so she should have voted for the first time in the 1940s. Uh, but she did not. Uh, she uh, voted for the first time in the 1960s because she was a black woman who lived in the South. Uh, and when I asked her, well, Madea, why didn't you? Like we call her Madea, which is short for mother dear. Uh, so, we, 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 you know, Madea, why didn't you vote? Why, did, why was it in until the 1960s? And she said, well, black people didn't vote. Well, black people didn't vote in those, those periods, certainly uh, prior to the 1960s because of the terror uh, that occurred uh, certainly throughout the South for uh, against uh, people of color who tried to uh, try to register, and it, 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 certainly in the 1950s and 60s and 40s, 50s and 60s, it was certainly you. They didn't. You could not even register uh, to vote. I used a number of firsthand accounts uh, in uh, my book. One is from one of my colleagues uh, whose mother was in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, Miss Myrtle Pless Jones, who was a graduate of South Carolina State University and had a master's degree from Michigan State University. She lived in Montgomery, Alabama in the 1950s. She went to register to vote in Montgomery, Alabama in the 1950s. And she was asked how many bubbles are in a bar of soap? She replied around 100. She was told that that was the wrong answer and was not given the right to, and was not given the right to register uh, to vote. Um, she did subsequently return and was uh, given the right to vote. But it was that persistence and certainly the, 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 the fact that she was asked, had to take a literacy test in order to register to vote. And that's not, and, and I use firsthand accounts of people I know to, to demonstrate how we're, we're you know, we're, we're, we're not that far away from when the, there were uh, restrictions on the right to vote based on race and they were so commonplace that I can, I can ask my grandmother, I can ask my father. I, I have other friends and colleagues and they all, everyone has a story. And it also used uh, firsthand accounts because I, we're, we're so data driven these days. And so, we, so everyone's talking about analytics. Like these numbers are real people. These people are real Americans. They're real citizens of, the, of these United States who should have the right to vote, but the barriers that were placed uh, prohibited them um, from doing so. Uh, I talk about certainly the, the terror attacks, right, in the South, certainly after Reconstruction in places like Colfax, Louisiana, which, was, which is not that far from the plantation where my uh, great-great-grandparents were enslaved, right? The, the, the plantation where my great-great-grandparents were enslaved is now a National Historic Site. So we have, uh, and, 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 and I have stories from my grandmother and others just to talk about certainly the terror that was associated with the right to vote, the fear uh, that was uh, put in place around the right to vote. And certainly tying it again to today, certainly, you know, the intimidation that uh, people have uh, in, in regards to voting in person in some places because of open carry laws and the bill and, 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 and certainly wanting to not uh, be approached or asked uh, questions 
that uh, you know uh, that any person who's trying to uh, uh, trying to vote and trying to exercise their right to vote should should have the the ability to do so freely, fairly, and without discrimination. So there was a number of stories, including that you know my father was the first African American uh, elected to the Polish jury, which is the equivalent of a county commission in my little hometown. He was able to do that um, because of the Voting Rights Act. My grandmother was able to uh, vote for the first time in the 1960s because of the Voting Rights Act. So you, you organize your book around some modern day forms of vote suppression. And, um, and you also argue that they are directly analogous to the forms of vote suppression that were prevalent in the past, both in the post reconstruction era and in the um, throughout the Jim Crow era um, that you're telling about your family. Um, and so I was hoping you can talk a little bit about those modern day forms of vote suppression, why, why you chose those, what, which ones you think are the biggest source of vote suppression and, and how they link back to the past forms of vote suppression that you um, just recounted? Well, one of the points that I try to make throughout the book is that uh, it, it doesn't necessarily uh, matter what the suppressive mechanism is called, right? That, th because, in, because the purpose of it, the purpose of it is the same. Whether we're talking about a poll tax, and there certainly have been cases that have equated uh, a, a restrictive voter ID with a poll tax because uh, persons have to buy, uh, purchase certainly underlying documents like a birth certificate um, and other, other documents, even a passport or, or other documents. And, and with a poll tax, you actually had to pay your tax and, and show proof of that when you went to, uh, when you went to actually cast uh, cast a ballot. So having to show something, right, showing something that where you actually have to prove that you're uh, eligible uh, to vote and, and, and to restrict it in such a way that's not commonplace, right? Which certainly my issues with restrictive voter ID laws, which say that there are only three or four acceptable forms of identification, like a driver's license, passport, a military ID. Um, and because the persons who are the legislatures that are passing those laws understand that there are persons there there are large swaths of persons who don't have those three or four acceptable forms of ID. In 2006, when Georgia passed its uh, voter ID restrictive voter ID law, it knew that 25 percent of African Americans in the state of Georgia did not own a car. So if you know that 25 percent of African Americans don't own a car, why would you require a driver's license? Because if you don't have a car, you, you, prob you probably don't have a driver's license. Uh, so it, it, particularly when there are other forms of identification, uh, other ways that you can, you can verify that you are who you say you are that don't require some a government issued identification or uh, things in other states. In Maryland, we, we, I, it's a signature uh, and I have to verify my address. Uh, and so there are many ways to do it. And so, Poll taxes, voter ID, uh, or it's a different name, but certainly have the same outcome. Certainly with the poll tax, uh, you certainly saw uh, uh, people of color, uh, voters, not uh, be able to meet those requirements and certainly were, were barred from the, uh, from the uh, ballot. I also use uh, you know, voter purges, uh, voter identification, voter deception, felon disenfranchisement, and other um, um, other disenfranchising mechanisms. Because what I want to do is is demonstrate that it's all of these things, right? That it's not just it's not just voter ID. It's not just voter purges. It's we're, we're looking at places where we have voter ID, voter purges, <laughs> felon disenfranchisement, and other um, mechanisms where you're talking about a large percentage of persons who are ineligible uh, to cast the ballot because they don't have the right piece of paper, right? Or don't have the, uh, don't, uh, or live in the, live in the wrong zip code. Um, so those, so there's certainly, you know, they're modern day uh, voter suppression tactics, uh, but they are very similar to uh, certainly things from the past in, in certainly in this respect that they have the same outcome and that is certainly the disenfranchisement of people of color. So one of the strongest tools 
to fight back against these kinds of voter suppression techniques has for the last half century been the Voting Rights Act. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. that is what enabled your grandparents to vote, to get elected to public office. Um, and that has been under siege. Um, you, you wrote this um, book, um, you know, not that long after the Supreme Court gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act, the preclearance provision of Section 5, you presciently expressed skepticism about the future of the Voting Rights Act, because since you wrote it, the Supreme Court has gone further and seriously damaged the nationwide protections against voting discrimination. And so uh, I have a couple of questions that follow from that. And so the first is, you know, like what um, the the court being a, a source of, um, if you could just reflect on the court being a source of the backlash and the retrenchment in voting rights. And also at this historic moment, when we are poised to confirm the first African-American woman to be a justice on the Supreme Court, just reflect on that moment in history and, and what this means. <laughs> we, we are uh, in a precarious position. <laughs> Uh, right now, certainly I reference uh, certainly the I think the, one of the first chapters is about the Voting Rights Act and the history and why we need it. And I think that's something that we don't talk about enough. Why did we actually need a Voting Rights Act of 1965? Right, because there were less than 10 percent of African Americans in the state of Mississippi who were registered to vote, as compared to around 70 percent of whites. And it's also important to understand that we that this we're not just talking about uh, African Americans. We're talking about people of color, persons in the in the in the south, in the southeast and the southwest, and even in New York, where there was a literacy test for uh, uh, Puerto Ricans, right, for persons who had moved from Puerto Rico to to New York. So it's and and you have and you have so you, there was certainly a need for the Voting Rights Act, and you saw it being utilized uh, for around um, forty or fifty years. Uh, and and that it and Barack Obama even said that it that his his success from being elected to the to the United States presidency it, he attributed it to the passage of the Voting Rights Act to the Voting Rights Act so it's very important but you you have certainly saw you started to see certainly the rollback with the Croft versus Marion case which was the voter ID case in around two thousand six two thousand eight um, and then. Uh, certainly with the Shelby County case, we saw a case prior to that in the Mudno case, which also, which said, we're looking at section five of the Voting Rights Act. We're not going to, we're not going to do anything right now, but Congress, you should fix this. Uh, and the fixing part had to do with certainly there are two primary, you know, two primary uh, parts to the Voting Rights Act. That's section two, which is nationwide prohibition against discrimination in voting. And it's essentially the litigation arm of of, of the Voting Rights Act and then section five, which was the administrative uh, portion where uh, jurisdictions had to send their voting changes, any and all voting changes to either the Attorney General of the United States or the District Court for the District of Columbia for approval before they could implement the changes. And those changes included anything from moving a polling place across the street to a congressional redistricting. And so the court said that section in 2013 in the Shelby County case, the court said that, that, that section five was outdated, which is very interesting because in the Burnbridge case, which it decided in the last term, it goes back to 1982 and says, we need, to, what about in 1982, things are okay. <laughs> we should, if, are, are things better than 1982? Then what's the problem, right? So it's like, so, Section five was outdated, but looking back to 1982, it's not, it's not outdated. So, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like the courts are, so, and I think that we have certainly, certainly as civil rights attorneys and as voting rights attorneys, we have, I think what we're seeing is an over-reliance on the courts, right? We have certainly looked to the Supreme Court to fix certainly the, the, the many of the problems that we've seen on the ground um, but we now know that the, the, the Supreme Court is not a safe haven uh, for um, civil rights. Uh, I am very optimistic um, uh, 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 over certainly the nomination and hopefully soon to be confirmation of Judge Katanji uh, Brown 
Jackson. It is Jackson, right? <laughs> and, and I um, uh, am, you know, I am very, I think, I think that she will have a, a great impact um, on, on the court, her being a public defender, as well as just being a good person, right? And, and serving and certainly having the experience and the intellect and certainly the temperance uh, to be a good uh, justice. Uh, so I'm, I'm very hopeful about that, but I, I think that um, certainly looking to the Supreme Court uh, for our uh, salvation, as we would say in the church, is, is, probably, is, is probably not the best um, option. So I, so I certainly argue that in the book as well, that we have to use all the tools in the toolbox. Got to use the policy, uh, got to use policy, got to use community organizing, and you also have to use litigation. So we still need to file these cases and take them all the way to the United States Supreme Court, but we also had to work to change legislation, uh, to, yeah. you know, they also have to work to organize and register people to vote and do all those things. And I do want to, um, you know, flag that uh, you're absolutely right that the, one cannot accuse this Supreme Court of being consistent or <laughs> um, at, or even um, explicable um, in its yeah. rulings on voting rights and freezing the status quo in 1982 is not um, uh, uh, an example of looking at modern problems. Uh, but as you are, one of the things that you say of the policy tools that you raise up in your book, and that's inspired by the Voting Rights Act, um, is something that hasn't gotten a lot of attention, and I was hoping you can talk about it a little bit, um, is the voter impact statement idea that you put forward as um, a, perhaps a, a, another policy tool that can help um, get us out of this you know, bad place. And I was hoping you can tell us a little bit about it and what inspired it and how you think it might help. Well, that was actually the first law review article I ever wrote after I, after I left the Department of Justice and came, came to the University of Baltimore School of Law as a law professor way back when and uh, wrote the uh, article where I proposed that uh, we should adopt something like what they use in uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, where the jurisdiction, where you place, where you place the burden on the jurisdiction to demonstrate that this change, in this instance, that the voting change does not harm um, people of color or that does not harm voters, and that they would have to, and that it, it certainly had some, some certainly some of the same. Uh, components as section five, where it provided notice, right? There had, there had to be notice before the uh, uh, law or rule could go into effect. And that there would be a, there would be a hearing, right? So folks, there would be notice, there would be a hearing and there would be an, an invitation for uh, persons within the community to speak and to, uh, to, to certainly understand what the rule, um, what the proposed rule, um, is or was, as well as how it might impact them, uh, and so it so that it so that the the, the jurisdiction would have the burden of uh, demonstrating that there would be minimal impact uh, on um, on the voters. So, uh, uh, an instance like you know the the Georgia voter ID law, where you can you imagine having a hearing and them and 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 and, and realizing that. 25% of people, black of African Americans in the state, didn't have uh, a, a, didn't have a driver's license, and so you would say, well, that might impact, <laughs> might adversely impact a large uh, percentage of your voters. Then uh, why don't we use something else, right? So certainly, voting voter impact statements is something I think I would hope uh, that um, would be used, and I haven't seen it yet. I saw that. Uh, that that article was actually uh, cited in the uh, in the case that was uh, that Judge Walker uh, gave today in the Florida voting rights case. So I'm really excited about that to see if he, if see if see if he talked about voting impact statements. That's so I'm excited about that. We're we're talking about all these um, bad news right now. Maybe you yeah. can tell a little bit what just happened in Florida to give um, some good news to the audience. Right. And so, so certainly one of the things, certainly one of the things that the Brennan Center has done over the last year so is, is, is continue to highlight the numbers of uh, suppressive laws that have been proposed as well as passed uh, in state legislatures across, across the country. Uh, one of those laws was the uh, law in Florida, SB 90, 
uh, that passed in 2021 uh, that certainly uh, voting rights um, advocates saw it as certainly beginning this, this period of regress, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. After, you know, after having record, uh, uh, record turnout and uh, no issues of voter fraud, uh, they passed a bill, uh, not unlike others, that essentially made it harder to get a mail-in ballot, uh, restricted drop boxes, um, uh, shortened early voting, and certainly made it harder for the supervisors of elections as well as the voters to actually access the right to vote. So uh, Advancement Project, which is the organization I work with, as well as a number of other uh, organizations, uh, filed a lawsuit challenging SB 90. Uh, and today, Judge Walker, uh, after, after a lengthy trial, uh, Judge Walker issued a, a 288-page opinion uh, where uh, we won, <laughs> which is, which is uh, uh, not very often, and, but, it, but certainly I, I believe merited. So uh, that I haven't had a chance to comb through the opinion, but again, just the periods of progress are met with regress. And these are these restrictive laws, and then you have to use all the tools in the toolbox to try to combat it. And I, and that can I make one other point. Another thing that folk have to understand is like while these laws are being passed, places like Georgia and Florida, all these state legislatures are up for uh, election this year. So that's another you know another tool in the toolbox is if folk aren't representing your interest, use the power of the voting. Uh, use use the power of the vote to um, to actually elect people who would be more representative of your interests, and so it's going to take hard work, um, uh, and, but it, 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 we certainly can do it. And, and I want to turn to the tools. I, I did want to note that we will, um, you know, we if we have time, we'll stage a dramatic reading of Judge Walker's ruling. But he <laughs> he too notes. I, I do want to flag that. We're in a real period of retrenchment, yes. and he's um, and he says that he understands that voting rights in America are under assault, and that even from the courts. And so he's not sure how long the mm -hmm. Voting Rights Act that he's enforcing and the constitutional protections are going to last. But he's issuing his ruling under that. And one of the things that he did that was remarkable is he brought the state of Florida under preclearance yes. with respect to legislation that impacts. Um, uh, drop boxes, um, the third party the individuals who help people register to vote. So very for this and the early voting time. So I think there's a significant step forward. Um, we'll, we'll see um, how this um, lasts throughout the court system, but it is a, a moment to um, celebrate Absolutely. these. Um, and, hopefully can, and hopefully can serve as a model in other places like Georgia and Texas <laughs> and other places across the Yep. across the country. So you started the book with an anecdote about your grandfather urging mm. you not to sleep at a dangerous time, <laughs> which you later understood to be urging you to be vigilant in the face of injustice and to get out there and take responsibility to fight this danger, racism, inequality. This is and you end with the same question, what will it take for the United States to wake from its slumber to what will it take to return to its pursuit of progressive and emancipating principles? And as you said, you're urging us to use all the tools that we have to pursue those goals. And you also say that we have more tools available to us than mm -hmm. in any other time in our nation's history. So I'm hoping you can, you've talked a little bit about some of those tools, but you can tell us what are some of those tools and also you know, what's, what's more now? What, what can we do that, like, so how do you see to the other side of this? And so in saying that we have more tools available to us now than we ever have, I'm particularly looking at my grandmother, again, the frame from which, the perspective from which I certainly wrote the book, that she lived to be 99 years old, almost 100 years old. And so all, so she saw these various cycles, right, of progress uh, and, and regress. And so when I graduated from NYU, she asked me, can you be a judge with that? Right. This is, so, so to, just to give you an example, certainly, <laughs> so she, she was just like, wait a minute, can you, can you be a judge with that? And so now to, to, to have, you know, folk who are graduating from law schools who look like me, 
right, folk who are being, uh, being uh, nominated to the United States Supreme Court who look like me. Um, is, 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 is for, for me, it certainly demonstrates that we have more, um, uh, we have more education, we have more money, we have more access, we have more, right? Of all the things that my grandmother who had an eighth grade education did not have. Right in this 100 years, and and in the book I talk about how we have these. How I said we have about 100 year cycles, like from the founding to the 15th Amendment, from the 15th Amendment to passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and it's been 56, 57, 56 years uh, since the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So, but I'm not I'm not willing to wait another 40 four years before, as we say in the South, see what the end is going to be, right? <laughs> we need, we got to work so that we, we can cut this in half, right? We don't need to, instead of going back, follow, following the, 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 the cycle uh, that we're in, that instead of doing that, that we use all these tools, we use litigation, we use policy, we elect officials uh, to the local uh, state uh, and federal offices that will represent uh, progressive uh, ideas and and promote uh, voting rights. We don't center uh, the right to vote uh, in our democracy, and so we want to elect people who 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 might do that. So we certainly have to uh, use all of these tools uh, that we have to to make sure that to make sure that uh, happens. We've seen in, in places like New York where you use is it ranked, cho ranked choice voting and mm -hmm. other alternative ways of voting uh, and, as opposed to drawing districts, right? So we have to continue to evolve uh, so that we can continue to move in, in the direction of democracy, right? In, a, in the direction where we uh, can have free, fair and uh, non-discriminatory access to the right to vote. I think, it, and Justice Ginsburg said in the Crawford versus Marion case that if you wanted, if you really wanted people to vote, then why would you essentially make it so hard to do so? And I think that's the question we have to continually ask ourselves. And so by having people like uh, Justice Brown Jackson, I'm <laughs> calling it into being, uh, and, and having people like you, Wendy, and others, right, who are fighting uh, to ensure that we can actually uh, operate as a true democracy. One of the other things I say in the beginning of the book is that there's always been this Bible verse that has perplexed me, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And I see that as our today, as our having a form of democracy, but denying it its true power because we have, we are, we are continuing to make it harder for people to access the right to vote. So I think we certainly have to have to think about certainly what it is that we want to see if we, re if we really want um, everyone to have the ability to cast a ballot and have a voice and to make it easy for them to do so. We certainly, we've seen that these laws that are being passed recently, laws like SB 90, which intentionally make it harder uh, for that to happen. And so we have to fight against that in every way and use every tool that we have to, um, to, 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 to combat it and certainly to overcome it. And so just two last quick things before we turn over to the questions, the audience questions are starting to pile up. But um, <laughs> you, since you wrote the book, the United States Congress came very close to passing transformative voting rights legislation that would have restored the Voting Rights Act and even strengthened it, that would have created baseline national rules for voting access that every American can rely on. And it failed by just two votes to overcome a filibuster. I guess my, as you're sort of looking in the cycles that you've mentioned of progress and um, and backlash, you know, where do you think we are now? Is this 1960 or are we 1860? Like, are are, are, are we um, like, are you how? And what gives you hope here that we're that we you you end with the we shall overcome? What gives you hope that we're going to overcome? <laughs> Well, and, and a change is going to come. There's also part change of the, is going to come. Right? The change, change is going to come, and it only comes. And so, so one of the things I tell people is that it's not going to be automatic. That it takes a it's a long uh, game, right? We, I remind uh, when I'm speaking at colleges and 
Other places I remind the young people that the Montgomery, everybody knows Rosa Parks, uh, but the Montgomery bus boycott was more than 350 days. For 350 days, people said, I am not going to ride this bus because they are, they are dishonoring me as a person, right? And so 350 days, and I asked them, what would they give up for 350 days? Would you give up Starbucks? What would you give up? Right, and so knowing that it's that where we are will take some sacrifice, right? It's going to take some hard work. Um, it's going to take some uh, certainly going to take vigilance. But we, and I think I, I am hopeful in that. Uh, certainly, in that certainly in the opinion that we received today, but also that one of the, one of the things that I, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I wanted people to read it and say, I knew something was going on. I didn't know what it was, now I know. And I know what I could do about it, right? And because I in, encourage people to think about not just presidential elections, or even midterms, but school boards and city council and county commissioner, uh, state legislature, right? And so, and, and to know who those, uh, who those persons are, and what are they, what are their platforms and, and, and don't just vote for people because you like their signs, right? But actually know what, what, it, is that they're, um, what it is that they're running on. So I, I'm hopeful because I think we've, 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 we've seen that uh, people are, I think, I believe people are more in tune um, to these issues, I think, than they ever have been certainly in my lifetime. Uh, so I'm, I'm praying and it's, uh, trusting and believing that um, we are paying attention, right? That we're not sleeping at a dangerous time, right? Because this is, this is a dangerous time. And I do think that we can, we can go forward or we can uh, go backwards. And so I want uh, us to certainly, so I, I am encouraged um, that uh, folk are talking about these issues more. Uh, people are uh, more uh, in tune to it. And, and hopefully that means that we'll uh, have that we will overcome, right? Because I have, we have to, right? We, we must uh, overcome because you know, we, we want to be a democracy and certainly not deny democracy its true power, uh, then we need to have a system where you can get a ballot <laughs> because you're, as an eligible person, right? You can, you can get a ballot and you can cast that ballot and that ballot will be counted in the way that you intended, right? And that's, that's, foundational democratic uh, principles that, you know, that we're having to fight for today. Um, and so I think, I think that's important that we continue to fight. I, I say throughout the book, it's a fight to vote for the right to vote. Uh, and um, so we'll just continue that, continue to fight um, and, 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 and to ensure that uh, all persons can have um, the right to cast the ballot freely. And I think that that's a sort of very important one to just emphasize that it's, the fighting to vote, it is the we, the people demanding the right to vote that is where you're drawing your inspiration and not the institutions that are gonna give it to people <laughs> that are failing right now. I mean, we have to change them and make them give it to everyone. Um, so I'm gonna turn to some of the audience questions and I'll start <laughs> with, um, uh, one question um, uh, references um, uh, just yesterday, um, Arizona passed a law requiring documentary proof of citizenship to register to vote in presidential elections. And so this audience member asks, is it time for federal officers to have clear and concise a universal set of laws for all 50 states? What do you think about that? <laughs> well, that, that's certainly right about whether or not we need an affirmative right to vote. Uh, maybe that's you know certainly asking if we should have if we should have meaning we have more constitutional amendments that uh, address the right to vote than any other right. Yet um, states and jurisdictions are still able to impact it in ways that that are restricted. Right? We don't. We have a lot of uh, thou shalt not. Right? Thou shalt not discriminate based on race or sex or age. Um, uh, but we don't have a, for example, something like the Second Amendment. You have the right to bear arms. Like we do, so there is certainly an argument out there that we need a, an affirmative right that says you have the right to vote, which by having that, certainly the argument is that it would make it harder for jurisdictions to pass laws uh, that actually make it uh, more difficult uh, for people to cast a ballot. So I think, there's, I think there's certainly room for that. And again, I think we need to use every tool, <laughs> every tool in the toolbox uh, and uh, certainly 
uh, passing uh, legislation of that sort, I think would be would be important. And speaking of like specific pieces of legislation, one um, one of the audience members um, notes that there is uh, over 700,000 Americans, a majority of whom are people of color that live in DC and have no mm -hmm. voting representation in Congress. And um, so wanted to know, do you agree this is vote suppression that um, HR 51 for DC, do you agree with HR 51 DC statehood? Um, and, and how do you feel about the filibuster and whether that's uh, vote suppression or used for vote suppression? Well, I'll say like uh, Reverend Warnock said, the Senator from Georgia, when someone asked him about, did he, was, how did he feel about the filibuster and, and, and what's connecting it to voting rights? And his response was, I don't care if they do it. I don't have. I don't care if they get rid of rid of the filibuster. I don't care if they keep it. All I need them to do is pass <laughs> legislation that can that can help. Certainly, certainly that can that can eliminate um, certainly the barriers that we uh, currently uh, have um, in the right to vote. So, we, with, in regards to DC, the ability of DC to vote, I, I think I've seen there's there's also legislation I think for Puerto Rico. Uh, to uh, have a voting member of Congress as well as a member of the uh, United States Senate. So those, there are certainly these perennial pieces of legislation along with um, restoring uh, voting rights for persons who were previously convicted of a felony. All, I think all of those things, so it, it, for example, in places like Florida, we're talking about 800,000 to a million people who do not have the right to vote because of previous conviction, conviction of a felony. So 700,000 people in DC, almost a million people in Florida, the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of persons in, in, in Puerto Rico, the, per, the persons in Puerto Rico, I think, uh, should, I, think those, I think there should be a demand uh, that um, they have the ability as well as the right especially the right to actually cast the ballot in our, in our elections. So there's um, some questions dealing with the motives of people that are, um, and, and that are suppressing votes. Um, you talk about this a lot in your book, both in the past and present. One um, questioner um, asks um, uh, uh, or suggests that the um, that this is an attempt by um, Republicans um, uh, to uh, repress votes um, to maintain power. Another questioner suggests that um, almost all state voting suppression laws seem to them to be passed them for um, by racial motivations. Um, and that questioner asks, um, you know, what's the motivation of the U.S. Senate not to pass the John Lewis? Um, uh, um, Voting Rights Advancement Act um, and Freedom to Vote Act. Um, you know, is is the are the opponents motivated by the desire to um, maintain a Republican power majority or by racial animus? Can you comment on that? And I'll add um, to that. And can you maybe talk about that um, over time, like how race and party, what, what's motivating this? Um, how those are bound up together or not? What well, we certainly saw after after certainly after Reconstruction, it was a the, the it was a white supremacist movement that passed the legislation in in uh, their state constitutional conventions, which they were required to have uh, in order to return to the Union. Right. So after the passage of the Thirteenth, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth Amendments, in order to return to the Union, they had to adopt the Thirteenth, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth Amendments. So they did that, but they also passed then passed laws. Uh, like the felon disenfranchisement law in Mississippi, which which designated those laws that it believed blacks were more likely to commit as disenfranchising. For example, in in it certainly post Reconstruction and during the state constitutional convention, Mississippi said if you committed timber theft or wife beating, you lost your right to vote, but not murder or rape. Right, so intentionally designating certainly what they believed were the types of laws that blacks committed but not whites in order to remove them from the voter rolls and that and, and that intent was very clear and it, they you had people like senator uh, um, pitchfork tillman who said this was our intent we were going to kill them we were going to remove them from the voter rolls 
any way that we could, including certainly using legislation and adopting things like poll taxes and others. To certainly today, people certainly say that it's certainly more partisan, uh, but it, but it's all it's a it's a it's a it's about power. It's it's, it's, it's all of this is about power. All of these um, uh, laws is about folk who were in power, who had power, who wanted to keep it. Uh, and if if in if passing legislation uh, is the way to do it, to make it harder, to limit who can actually cast the ballot, then that's then that's the tool uh, that will be used. I and it certainly as a voting rights attorney, I, I tell people I don't care if you vote Republican or Democrat. I want to ensure that you have the ability to get to a poll, to to register to vote, to go to a poll, to cast a ballot, and have your vote counted. Um, so that so this this idea of whether it's uh, one side or the other, we do recognize that it's certainly been primarily Republican uh, led legislatures legislatures that are passing these uh, pa passing the state legislation in the United States Senate. I wish I knew <laughs> uh, because everyone loves John Lewis or certainly loved John Lewis and continue most continue to love him. Um, even though he passed away a few years ago. Um, and everyone talks about, you know, democracy and voting, but we can't get, um, can't, can't get Congress to, to, to finish, right? To finish uh, what, what, what was started. Uh, and it's, it's, but it, again, with, even with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, it wasn't, you know, it took several attempts. And unfortunately it took Bloody Sunday for uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson to say enough, Congress, you must pass this legislation. I hope we don't need another instance like that for Congress to say enough. We have to ensure that everyone can have the right to vote. And I'd add like from the perspective of the Americans who are the subject of vote suppression, it doesn't matter if the motive is race or party or both, if you're, right. it's, it's discriminatory in how it's received and, and in its effect and, right. the, and the effect's the same. And can um, I add one other thing is that that's, that's an important point because these laws, the laws that I outlined in the book, they do primarily impact people of color, but whites are affected and people from Republican parties are affected and, as well as uh, the Democratic party. And so it's, it's that these, these, this system needs to be fixed, right? The system of suppression needs to be fixed. So um, on this sort of, what can we all do about it? One of the questioners asks, what do we do about the vote suppression happening in the South, like Georgia and Texas now? What do we, um, many of us who are not living in Georgia and Texas, but maybe some of us here are, um, what, what tools do we have in our toolbox to help um, uh, address that? I tell people to do four things, educate, legislate, litigate, participate. So first, you need to educate yourselves about the various laws, not only in your state, but since you're interested in Georgia and Texas, certainly what are the new laws in Georgia and Texas and how might they impact, uh, impact Georgians, as well as understanding how laws are, law, what laws are being passed in your state or jurisdiction and how they might impact you. And, and legislate, knowing certainly as these legislatures are in session, what kinds of laws are they uh, considering that can impact your right to vote, right? Because a lot of legislatures are in session right now. Georgia's in session. Uh, I think Florida just wrapped up a few weeks ago. Uh, so those legislatures are passing laws that are in, in some instances making it even harder uh, to, to cast a ballot. Knowing, knowing what those uh, laws are, knowing who your elected officials are or what officials are actually uh, supporting it and contacting them is, is very important. Um, so it's, it's um, educate, legislate, litigate. There are organizations like the Brennan Center, like Advancement Project, like NAACP, LDF, and others, Demos. Uh, I'll start rattling off and forget one or two, so forgive me, but all of their organizations that are fighting uh, to ensure 
that we have a free and fair democracy. So support those organizations, support Brinson, support Advancement Project, support them financially. Um, and you know, so if you're a student, do an internship. Uh, everything's remote now. You can do an internship um, remotely in supporting the organizations and then participate. So if you're, if, if you're interested in, in what's happening in Georgia and Texas, but you don't live there, there are organizations that are working in those areas who could use your support uh, and, and researching and finding out who, who, what, what those organizations are, how you might support them, uh, as well as uh, in your jurisdiction, in your hometown, signing up to be a poll worker. Uh, poll workers, election workers are under siege. Uh, so it's important to serve as a poll worker, to work as, as a poll watcher, sign up for organizations like the NAACP, like Election Protection, who uh, or that um, uh, work uh, during elections, not only to register, but to also to ensure that uh, there are there that that there are no barriers to the uh, to to the ballot box. So I think that's a terrific place to end this conversation. I want to apologize to the one audience member whose question I didn't get to, which was very interesting. And I want to thank you, Yolda, for such a wonderful conversation today and um, our listeners for um, staying with us. I wish you best of luck with your new book, Uncounted Voter Suppression in the United States, um, in America. And on behalf of the Brennan Center and our co-partner, the New York University's John Bradamus Center, I want to thank you all for attending. I'm Wendy Weiser and have a good night. Thank you all.